Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Marvellous to actually be introduced to you all and what a diverse group of terrific women from across our region. Uh, look, I wanted to talk to you today about my life as an activist in green politics in Australia and also as part of the global environment movement. But first, I wanted to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Hobart in Tasmania. It is the land of the Muhanina people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We have a long way to go in Australia still in acknowledging and valuing the culture and wisdom of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And that's one of the campaigns that the Greens continue to be involved in, in Australia and around the world to stand up for First Peoples. Now, women across our region, as you all know, face many barriers as they try to lead their communities uh, in trying to secure a better life and, of course, in trying to uh, work for a safe climate. So thank you for your passion and your commitment. Now, it's important that those of us who have been able to be elected, had experience in elected politics, uh, share our experiences as a way of helping other people who might be considering uh, standing for parliament or just being part of a political party, the Greens in particular. Now, helping green women to be more effective and confident in politics and in community activism was the main reason I wrote my book when I left politics after 25 years. And so I wrote a book and it's called An Activist Life, which you may or may not have seen. But it's full of stories of my experience over the years. It shows how I was a community activist before I went into politics, and I suspect most of you are already community activists before you got involved with the Greens. I was elected as an independent first because there was no Green Party at that time in 1989, and then was part of forming the Green Party in Tasmania and forming the Australian Greens and ultimately the Global Greens. And over that time, I can tell you there have been many successes, many failures, many barriers, an awful lot of sexism, dirty tricks, you name it, it's happened. So we shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. We've all had those experiences from time to time and we can share how we have dealt with them. But overall, what I realised about myself and actually about most people in the Greens is that we've all reached the same conclusion and that is the way to, to be happy in life is to be purposeful, to actually put our skills to use, uh, trying to make the world a better place rather than just sitting around complaining about things and feeling demoralised and disempowered. And young people know that, which is why they are marching right now around the world in the strike for climate. And frankly, I think that movement is the most inspiring thing that's happened in recent decades. Now, I just wanted to talk about how I got into politics because sometimes people have a view that you have to be well connected, you have to have money, you have to have a knowledge of politics to get into politics. Well, that isn't actually the case. Um, I had a pretty conservative upbringing in a poor regional rural community. I was uh, brought up on a small family dairy farm in Northwest Tasmania. And I had to get scholarships to go to both the secondary school I went to and to university. And I went through university on a teacher studentship. So I certainly didn't come from a wealthy background, nor was my family in any way involved in politics. It was during the time I was at university that there was, uh, that was the 1970s when there was a real awakening around the world of women's rights and environmental rights. It was the marching against the Vietnam War. It was a period of great activism. So it was a, a really eye-opening period for me as a young person. But even so, I still thought that if you provided enough 
good information to politicians, then they would make the right decisions based on that information. But that idea was promptly overturned when in Tasmania, the government decided to go ahead and destroy a beautiful lake called Lake Pedder. It was a mountain alpine lake in a national park, a unique area, and they destroyed it with a hydro dam, with an impoundment. And so I decided then and there that the next time that happened, I would get involved. And it was actually that lake, Lake Pedder, the flooding of Lake Pedder, that led to the formation of the United Tasmania Group, uh, which is the world's first Green Party, which was followed shortly after by the Values Party in New Zealand. So that was a time when people were really thinking about alternative views of politics and what you might do in the world. In 1982-83, the government decided to flood the, the Franklin River in Tasmania to dam the Franklin River for another hydro scheme. And as I had decided earlier, I got involved in the campaign. I went to the blockade. I was arrested and went to Risdon Women's Prison, which was the women's prison, prison in Tasmania. Now, that whole experience was incredibly empowering because what it taught me about myself was that I actually had the uh, capacity to deal with that level of aggression and that I could engage in nonviolent direct action and get through it reasonably well. So it showed me I, could, I actually could have the courage to step up if necessary and it showed me I could withstand criticism and also uh, that it gave me confidence. However, after the Franklin campaign, I went back teaching uh, to the school teacher. I was a high school teacher. And it was after some years that two multinational companies, North Broken Hill and Naranda of Canada, uh, decided to build a huge polluting pulp mill in the district in which I was brought up. And so I decided to work with the local farmers to try to stop that dam. We held meetings in the local school hall. We formed a local local committee of concerned residents. We opposed the pulp mill and we set to work. And it was only then that I actually realized that being a teacher had given me so many organizational and advocacy skills uh, to be able to present the information in a way that people understood. I had no money, uh, but I was a passionate advocate and uh, went on with the campaign. It went out of Tasmania nationally and it also went global. In the end, it was working with Greenpeace of Canada and really putting pressure on Naranda in Canada that forced them to withdraw from the project. And that was again a lesson that you often cannot win the battles that you are fighting locally. You have to take it national or global and then bring the pressure back home. After that, uh, the government decided that with the pulp mill having uh, been destroyed as a project, that they would call an election. Uh, and if they won the election, they would get the pulp mill back on track. And so that's why I ended up standing for politics. It was the worst time in my life. I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old at the time. And really being going into politics and having to go to a parliament that was nearly four hours drive from where I lived uh, was a seemingly impossible thing to do. But so many people had put their faith in me in the campaign against the pulp mill that I didn't feel I had a choice. And so I ran for parliament and won a seat. And that was 1989. So I think what I wanted to say to you was uh, in thinking about green politics in the campaigns that you're running locally and in the campaigns you're running for election. Uh, the first thing to do is to think about, okay, I can actually do this. To actually have the confidence to know that as a person in the community with skills and passion, 
you actually can do this. But the first thing is to do is to know your strengths, to work out what skills have you actually got that will be useful in the Greens Federation or in any of the Green parties or to take into Parliament? What skills might you need that you don't actually have? And one of those skills obviously is in media training. Uh, it could be in computer skills, information technology training. It might be that you need help in buying the equipment you need in order to be able to communicate effectively and work effectively. And you may, you may need help from someone in understanding the politics, actually who makes the decisions relevant to the issue that you are concerned about or campaigning on. And think about who you could go and ask to get help to be more focused on where you can bring influence to bear because knowing that is very empowering. The second thing is you should know your opponents. You have to know who are the people in the current uh, political scenarios. Uh, you have to know um, who are the people with a vested interest in whatever it is, the ongoing status quo, that are going to do everything in their power to try and stop you. And then you also have to think about personally the consequences of your actions at a personal level, at a family level, at a community level, and possibly in terms of the law. It's really important these days with social media, the way it is, that you have thought that through. Because whether you like it or not, as someone involved in politics, and uh, people will post things about you, which your family will read, which your friends will read, which your employers will read. Um, and you have to have thought about the extent to which you want them to be exposed to that or ways in which you might minimise that. And in politics, I made the decision from the earliest age, from when I first went in when the children were two and four, that I would not involve them in my political career. I didn't put them in photo shoots. Uh, I kept them out of the media and it really paid off because the media came to respect that I didn't use my children and family to try to advantage my political career and so in turn they didn't go after them. But it's worth thinking about those issues of the extent to which you want them to be involved or not. You also um, have to, uh, as I said, weigh up the consequences of your actions and how far you can or can't go with nonviolent direct action. When I first got arrested, uh, it was for trespass, which was a non-criminal, uh, it had no criminal penalty in terms of getting a criminal record. Over the years, governments have got a lot harsher on protesters and now you will get a criminal record in Australia for even uh, just um, locking onto a piece of equipment or standing in the way of a bulldozer, etc. You could end up with a criminal record. Now that has consequences for the careers you might have, for the visas you might get or not get. And so that's why I urge older people whose careers are over and have retired to be the ones that get on the front line. Let them be the ones that get the criminal record so that our children and grandchildren have the broadest options for the political careers that they might, uh, or other careers that they might want to have in their life. Next advice is know your allies. Who are the people who are going to support you because you need allies. You need them with friends, you need them with family, you need them with colleagues, you need them locally and globally. Think about who are the people who are likely to come and support you on social media, in the media, as referees and so on. Think about the local non-government organisations that might come out 
out and say, yes, this person's doing a good thing. Think about the global environment NGOs or global social NGOs who might have a local branch in your country or your city like Amnesty International, like Greenpeace, like um, Sierra Club, uh, Land Conservancy, any of those big ones. Are they allies? And of course, think about the global Greens as an ally to your local Green Party. Now, just a couple of examples there. The Zambian Greens uh, had a horrendous problem with a mine that was being uh, pursued by an Australian mining company. So they got in touch with me and they, as when I was the leader of the Australian Greens, but they also got in touch with NGO with Global Witness and others in London. And the result was that we were able to bring pressure to bear around the world uh, to assist them. Unfortunately, corruption in Zambia was such that the judge who gave an injunction on the project was moved to a rural area and another one more sympathetic to the mine was put in his place. But it shows how you can leverage the power of Greens and others elsewhere in the world to help especially if the company is based in Europe because European Greens through the European Parliament and or their local branches can help. In recent years, I've been fighting against Yara, which is a Norwegian company, trying to build a, or has now built, a big factory in Western Australia, which will destroy Aboriginal petroglyphs. But I contacted the Norwegian Greens who facilitated questions being asked in the Norwegian parliament. And I went to Norway and they were also able to facilitate meetings with the company, with various parliamentarians and so on. So break down your issue into who are your friends, who are your opponents, who are your personal support network, where are the points of leverage you might have. The next thing is you really need to think about knowing yourself in these campaigns. Yes, you know your strengths, but how well do you know yourself as to whether you'll stand up to the stress of it, whether you can stand criticism, and how well you think you'll be able to manage. And it's worth taking yourself fairly slowly. Sometimes you get plunged into it like I was, and that can work too. But it's often a good idea to just continue to step up, not be too comfortable, take the next level of responsibility in your group or in your party or in your region to see whether you feel like you've got the confidence and ability to go the next step. Finally, get organised. If you're to lead a community group or stand for election, you need to be an organiser. You need to have helpers and a support group. You know, I had people who helped me look after the children. That was incredibly important to help with childcare. I had people who cooked meals for me and put them in the freezer so that when I came home, I didn't have to cook as well. I had people who loaned me clothes because as I said, I didn't have very much money when I first stood for, for parliament. I certainly didn't have the sort of clothes I needed. And so friends loaned me outfits to wear wear on television, to wear at rallies, to wear at major um, public events. I also had friends who helped the fundraising, who would go out and organise to raise money. And it's also useful to have a lawyer as part of your support network because sometimes you need to check before you say something or write something in a press release or accuse someone of something to find out whether it's defamatory and whether you are going to be uh, subjected to uh, a legal threat as a result of doing it. You also need to know the costs, uh, financial costs. I know in uh, Korea, for example, it's really expensive to stand for parliament and in various places around the world, it, it's varying degrees. The Australian Greens pay the registration of uh, candidates. They don't, they don't pay that personally. So you need to um, set up your party in such a way as to fundraise to try and take away the financial barriers 
from people being able to stand. But also, if you're in a Green Party, you need to make sure that the rules of that Green Party are such that there are, there's equal opportunity for women to be pre-selected in winnable positions, not just pre-selected as a candidate, but as a candidate in the seats that you're most likely to do well in, as well as, um, as any other uh, candidate. My next point is become an expert because it's very hard to ridicule someone who knows what they're talking about. Uh, so if you are going to stand and put yourself out there as a spokesperson, as a candidate, as a point of reference for the Greens or for a community uh, activist group, you need to know what you're talking about. That needs, means you need to really research the subject uh, in my case, it was pulp mills. I knew everything there was to know about pulp mills. And when I was in the federal parliament as leader of the Greens in Australia, I, I studied the climate and all the legislative mechanisms on the climate so that I knew exactly what I was talking about. And it was very hard for people to, they mightn't like what I said, but they couldn't say that it wasn't right. So, um, the other thing you need to do if you're standing for parliament, but especially if you're elected, is get to know, to know the rules of how the parliament operates. So you need to study the standing orders of the parliament. So you know every single opportunity that you might exploit to be able to get up and speak, whether that's a question, whether that's a motion, whether that's an adjournment speech, whether that's introducing a private member's bill, you have to know that and the Greens are usually the people in parliaments who know the rules better than anyone else because it's only by knowing the rules that we get the opportunities. Uh, recently, I was in um, Malaysia in Sarawak talking to a young Indigenous man who's become a senator there and he had no idea about how the upper house in Malaysia works even though he's been appointed to it. So I got him to send me the standing orders and it had an English translation. I've now been through them, sent them back and told him what the best opportunities are for him to actually help his community in that parliament. So that's again, something that's really uh, critical. And it's how, for example, Greens with only a few members of parliament can use the parliament rules and our numbers, especially if we're in balance of power, to achieve change. And I achieved uh, my private members bill, secured gay law reform in Tasmania at a time we only had four members of the parliament. Um, I, I was successful in achieving gun law reform in Tasmania at exactly with only four members in the parliament. And when we achieved the carbon price in Australia, we had 11 members in the Australian federal parliament. So you can make significant change if you know the rules and you use your numbers. But as a, uh, as a general rule, expect to be ignored uh, when you first get going. So I know it's demoralising when you're established as a Green Party and you have a press conference or you put out a press release and no journalists turn up and it's not reported anywhere. Never mind. That is always the case. And I think it's Worth remembering, of course, what Gandhi uh, had to say, and uh, we always refer to that in the Australian Greens, and that is, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And that ultimately is what's happened to us so many times. The most recent example in Australia with the uh, Royal Commission into the banks, the Greens were laughed at when we said there should be a Royal Commission into the banks. We pursued it, we pursued it, we pursued it until there was a Royal Commission into the banks and I can tell you the banks haven't liked it very much. The next thing I wanted to talk about was um, expect dirty tricks. Uh, when you're a Green or a community activist, you are taking on the powers that be. They are people who are powerful because they've controlled the system for a long time and they don't like it if people stand up and start exposing that. And so they will ridicule you. They will laugh at you. Um, when I was 
uh, in the Tasmanian Parliament, they used to say to me, oh, look at Mrs Milne and her jam-led recovery, uh, implying that a housework can only make jam and not actually be able to run the economy. Um, they'll accuse you of abandoning your children because you've come into elected office and your children are still at home. They will do all sorts of things, accuse you of things uh, wrongfully. And in our case, they even changed the electoral system to try to get rid of the Greens. So that's, I've written a lot of these things in my book of all the different ways that the powers that be have tried to discredit green parliamentarians, green leaders in and outside the parliament, and you just need to be uh, aware of them. The final point I wanted to talk to you about today is women's leadership. Now, uh, it's critical that um, the Asia Pacific Greens, uh, this group, think about what sort of leadership would you really want to work with or what sort of leader would you want to be if you ended up with the privilege of leading a Green Party? And I thought about that a lot because one of the most ineffective forms of leadership is actually male leadership models. And that is essentially, it's top down, it's authoritarian, it basically uh, shares information with only a very small inner group of people because that is power. And it also means that that one person takes all the credit when things are going well and then blames everybody else when bad things uh, happen. Now, I've seen that top-down leadership in politics uh, all over the place, and I've also seen it work, uh, seen it happen in green parties in various parts of the world. And so it's critical to think, how would you do it differently? And so I have always uh, been in politics as an activist, but been in politics with the idea that I'm part of a team that my job is to make sure that every member of that team achieves to the highest level they possibly can because it makes, it value adds everything that we're doing. And so flatter structures, sharing information across your whole team and trusting people in that team to use that information constructively, wisely and not against the team is really important. So it's based on collaboration and trust rather than competition and power and punishment if people uh, step outside that mould. Now, it's hard to achieve because the media love to just have a presidential style so they only go to that, that leader, not the team. And they like the notion of the all-powerful leader telling everybody else what they have or have not to do. But I think it's important in this century especially where all of those old authoritarian models are now uh, resurging with the Trump model. You've got the Putin model. You know, model. Um, we're seeing it, you know, the authoritarian leader all powerful, backed by the military, everybody else shut out, no transparency, that the Greens stand up and say, no, that is not the kind of leadership that we aspire to. We work with the community as a team. We share, we're open, we're non-violent, and we're not going to go down that path of power and punishment, spying on people, jailing people, so a large part of our work has to be on things like uh, trying to get um, a change to electoral systems to make sure that you have much better and broader representation. So that's one of the, the first things that we need to be doing is make sure that we get proportional representation. So you get the number of seats, percentage of seats that you actually get the vote for. And secondly, within our parties, 
to share the power, to, sh to share the ideas and to have as much transparency as we can possibly do. I think that's really important in this century because uh, there has to be a different model from the one that is re-emerging. And uh, finally, I just say to you that uh, people say to me, oh, well, this is all, all great, but the fact is there's not many Greens around the world. Well, if you go back through history, as Margaret Mead said, that small groups of committed people are the only people who've ever changed the world. And that's the fact. If you look at it, it's always well-connected, thoughtful, courageous, non-violent people who've gotten together to change things. And I feel like that is exactly what the Greens can offer uh, in this century. And I have never been of the view that we are too small to change things. We're growing. There's been a terrific green wave across Europe in the recent European elections. And I think people are realising that the Greens are passionate, committed, they've got integrity, and they're absolutely the only ones out there in whichever country you talk to them, campaigning on the climate and campaigning against the power of big business and the old vested interests trying to actually hold on to the extraction of the earth's resources in a way that is completely unsustainable. So thank you for being involved in the Greens and uh, stick with the Greens, step up in the Greens, take on leadership in the Greens and try and uh, exercise a different leadership model because this will be the model of leadership this century. It mightn't evolve uh, as quickly as we would like, but it is the antidote to the um, disempowerment that people are feeling uh, as the all-powerful leader of the old order uh, seems to be having something of a resurgence. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Can I jump in and say thank you? I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes, I can. Who am I supposed to call? Oh, my... okay. Hi. Hi, this is Claudine. I'm in Adelaide. Oh, okay. Hi, Claudine. Hi. Yep, I just wanted to thank you so much for that. It was very inspiring. I don't think I personally want to be a leader, but it helps in, in knowing how to best support those who are leaders um, within the Green Party as well. So yes, that was very informative and helpful and inspiring. And I just wanted to thank you so much. Oh, well, that's great. And it is so important because people sometimes say to me, oh, but there's really, I'd love to help you, but there's nothing I can do because they think that the only help you need is high level policy advice or something like that. But when yes. you say to them, actually, could you drive me somewhere because I'm so tired, it's dangerous for me to get in the car and drive there, but I have right. to a meeting. Um, just having someone to, to drive you there and pick you up again or someone to actually feed you at some point or you know, so yeah. it's, it's just, you know what it's like. There are so many ways in which you need to be helped and unfortunately men in, well, not unfortunately, but men in politics tend to have wives and families and partners who do that. Yeah. Women in politics don't. Uh, gen right. well, they may have partners and things, but they may have their own careers and so on. It's just a different dynamic. So yeah. you can just ask, what help could I give you? Uh, you'll be amazed at, at uh, you know, it's quite often quite practical things. Okay. Thank you for that. Hello. It's Marie Therese. Hi, Marie From Therese. Green Party of Lebanon. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Let me congratulate you and thanks Rashana and Anita for the, for the wonderful choice. And we are really impressed. It was a big pleasure hearing you share your history, your experience. It's really amazing. Hopefully we can implement your experience in our life, in our Green Party. And we ask you and we need you to stay near us and in our side, especially during our new election. 
It is possible to stay always and all the time near us. We need the people to inspire us like you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. So uh, we are saying if we ha anyone has any questions, then you can raise your hand or uh, you can ask directly. I have a question uh, from from Ken in North Queensland. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me more about the green power model and that you're talking about the sharing model and where I can access more information about this. The access information on it, it's just really lived experience. That's why um, I wanted to talk about it today because it's a proactive choice the way that you choose to lead and um, there's certainly nothing's been written much in the Greens about it I have referred to that was a choice I made in the way that I led the Greens and I've mm. talked about green leadership uh, there's a chapter on it in my book in which I just talk about the fact that it is entirely consistent with green philosophy to lead in in that way and the best way of of thinking about it is to try and have it implemented in the local groups that you work in mm -hmm. in the Greens um, to make sure that we do have that flatter structure that, that allows everybody to contribute, that is inclusive to um, everyone there. That's a really, and, and not only not there, but to actually recognise when we don't have diverse enough groups and see what we can proactively do to get as many different people involved as possible. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Hi, Christine. Um, Rose from Melbourne. Um, loved your book. Um, it is very inspiring. I want to um, raise the issue that many women just don't see themselves as leaders uh, and can't conceive of themselves as leaders, even if those around them um, see it that way. And my experience also in Asia Pacific is, I mean, there are just so many um, ways in which women are kept out of politics, um, structurally and culturally. Uh, and it's also been often said that uh, you have to ask a woman uh, not once, not twice, but up to seven times um, it, to get involved before she will, you know, take you seriously. Um, would you like to comment on that and what your experience has been in terms of encouraging um, women to take more responsibility and not just be followers all the time? Yes, well, that's absolutely right too, Rose. The thing is, um, the best leaders are the people who don't step up the first time. In fact, the people who rush forward at the start saying, you know, pick me, pick me, pick me, are uh, very often uh, the ones who've got a huge amount of personal self-confidence but don't actually have a lot of the skills. And this is always a comparison between um, men and women frequently men will apply for a job when they haven't got half the skills and the women won't apply because they don't have half the skills and yet they're actually equivalent uh, in terms of what their experience and things is so my, my advice is yes you have to identify people in your group who you think have the skills uh, and the passion and so on to lead but it's a matter of talking to them about it and convincing them. And yes, it might have to be asking them and talking about it uh, uh, you know, many, many times. In fact, the, most of the women in Australian politics are not people who've put themselves out there first. They've actually been people who've been approached by people in politics to consider whether they would step up. In terms of confidence, um, this absolutely comes back to um, what you were saying and I was just, um, I, I wrote down the, uh, the names of people as they, um, as they introduced themselves and I think it was Claudine who said, well, I'm not really anyone and I don't do anything. And I thought that is exactly what's the problem with a lot of 
women in the Greens and in the social justice movement, they are someone and they do plenty of things. So it is a matter of confidence and it's a matter of recognising that actually the skills you've got are valuable. It's just they may not be valued in a, in a male uh, leadership context. So, you know, there has never been at one level a better time for women to step up because uh, the broader society is now recognising that you have to have 50% representation of women. And so the political parties are now all looking for female candidates. So that is something that hasn't happened before. It's now evident in every board, in every um, leadership team, in business and so on, they are now looking for women uh, to fill those 50% positions. Unfortunately, they are also looking for women who share um, the same philosophical view as many of those, as obviously the corporation and so on. But nevertheless, the ethos is changing to say that you are not a legitimate organisation unless you have 50% women. So on that basis, and in politics, 50% women in elected positions, we need women to step up. And so I just ask people, that's why I was saying it's important to reflect on what skills you've got, what skills you might need, who you might need to go and talk to as an ally and work out how you could actually do it. So instead of just saying, no, I can't do it, think about, well, actually I could, but I would need this assistance to be able to. And that's what I'm urging all of you to think about. Sit down and consider if you could step up, what would you need to help you? Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Christine. Really wise words. Yes. Thank you very much, Christine. And Rose, uh, we have got a question from Sarul now. Sarul from Mongolia. Um, hello, Christine. Uh, you uh, your personal experience in politics and green politics is very inspiring and I'm very happy that I was able to attend this uh, webinar and my question is um, uh, what would you say why young people would be involved in uh, green movements and green politics because I think the Green Party uh, in all over the world is a very unique in comparison to other political parties which are traditional political parties and um, this is a kind of civil society based uh, party uh, and this would be the advantage of the all green parties and um, this is my thought uh, on the base of mongolian green party so i would like to hear your um, thoughts on good reasons uh, for young people uh, to become a Green Party member? Well, the young people are joining the Greens around the world. In fact, uh, in Australia, the, the 18 to 24 year olds uh, make up the uh, majority of the Green vote. So young people are joining the Greens, but they're also voting for the Greens. And I think you'll find uh, it would be the same in Europe. I haven't seen the breakdown in the uh, um, European uh, Parliament elections recently, but I think that's the experience. And the reason that young people uh, join the Greens and work with the Greens is because we're explicit about our objectives and the young people around the world are increasingly desperate about the climate and the climate emergency and the biodiversity collapse around the world and so are the greens we're out there saying that's our number one issue it was the number one issue for the greens in the australian election and in the european elections and increasingly it's going to be the number one issue everywhere and the greens are very explicit saying we want 100 percent renewable energy and we oppose uh, the extraction of fossil fuels and we want a timeline for closing down uh, coal-fired power stations and so on. So it's very clear uh, where the Greens stand and I think that attracts young people. Excuse me a moment, that's my phone. I should have turned it off. Just a moment. <laughs> Sorry. 
Sorry about that. Um, so yes, young people, uh, there's every reason to join the Greens because A, we are fighting the climate emergency and secondly, integrity in politics. We're the ones saying that corruption has to stop and that we are prepared to introduce anti-corruption measures. And we will take, and because we are, and this is unique about the Greens, which should excite young people around the world, and it certainly excites me, we are the only political party in this century which has parties in every country, or now in more than 90 countries in the world, and we all share exactly the same objectives because they're written in the Green Charter and you can't be a Green Party if you don't agree. So it's essentially ecology, social justice, uh, peace and non-violence and participatory democracy. So we all do that. Therefore, you have allies in, in all these countries to be able to help you. And in my personal campaigning, just the fact that if it's a Canadian company causing trouble, I can get on to Elizabeth May in Canada and say, can you do something about that? What can you tell me? Who can you get to help? If someone has trouble with an Australian company causing trouble in their, in their country, they can get on to me and I can get on to the Greens in Australia to ask questions in the Parliament and so on. Young people need to understand that the Greens is actually a mechanism for them to have global reach. Uh, when Frank was elected in Rwanda, which is very exciting, I think, um, the first time since the genocide that any opposition people have been elected and two Greens were elected in Rwanda, I was able to get in touch with Frank and say, OK, well, let's talk about how we might be able to help you uh, be more effective in that parliament. So I think talking to young people about A, we stand for integrity and changes in the power structures while fighting the climate emergency. And B, this gives you reach in your campaigns around the world are two really important factors. The, the harder thing is why do people leave or not continue to vote green when they get into their 30s and 40s? And that's not something... Um, we've yet been able to uh, really establish in Australia. And certainly as people get older, they, the green vote in the over 60s is relatively small. And that's disappointing because you would hope that people are thinking about their grandchildren, but they're not in many cases. Um, or they think that money is more important to their grandchildren than a planet to live on. But anyway... So that's my, that would be my pitch to young people and is my pitch to young people that um, we are not about powerful vested interests, we're about people and the community and, a, and strong democracies. I've already spoken, but I have a question if I could. It's Claudine. Yes, Claudine. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, with this Adani, specifically in Australia, with this um, government again, this liberal government that got in, they, they've given the green light to Adani, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> um, and I learned from you, from the Australian Greens um, website, from reading all the policies before this last election, that Australia is the number one exporter of coal in the world. And I was wondering if there's going to be a big campaign, a big Greens campaign here that can try to let Australians know that we're the number one exporter and that it's not that China and India are, um, are, are the ones polluting the whole planet because they've got all the people, so there's nothing we can do about it in actuality. There's a lot we can do about it because we're selling the coal to China and India. And I was wondering whether or not there's going to be a movement here to try to expose that and let Australians know that there's actually a lot as a tiny country with a, you know, well, well a tiny population, not a tiny country, but um, to, let, um, to let Australians know that there's actually an awful lot we can do because we can stop exporting the coal. Well, the Greens are already running a very strong um, 
anti-Adani campaign. We were the only political party in the recent federal election which was explicit in saying that we opposed uh, opening up the uh, Galilee Basin and Adani and uh, Palmer's mine and Gina Reinhart's mine. We have been very explicit about opposing that. We've been very explicit in standing against Adani and exposing uh, what they have been doing in India and the the uh, Bob Brown Foundation. Bob was a former leader of the Australian Greens. He held a vigil outside the Indian High Commission in Canberra last weekend to highlight uh, the corruption in Adani and also in the company Adani and uh, in, in what's happening as they're trying to destroy primary forests in India on another project, just standing in solidarity with Indian people there. Yeah. So the Greens um, ran a very strong anti-Adani campaign and of course uh, Bob led the anti-Adani convoy. In terms of a policy platform, the Greens uh, put forward a levy on every export tonne of coal that left the country. Of course that was um, ridiculed by both of the Liberal and, well, by the Liberal National and Labor parties. So the problem we have in Australia is that both of the major parties totally support ongoing coal mining and yeah. ongoing export of gas. And as a result, the mainstream media, uh, as I was saying before about being ignored, the mainstream media pretty much ignores the extent of opposition from the Greens because Liberal and Labor between them have got the numbers in the parliaments. Yeah. But the other thing about the... Um, is that the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change accounting rules, means that the pollution or the greenhouse gases from Australian coal is only counted, uh, not in Australia, but where it is burnt. So it's counted uh, in the countries to which it is exported. And so that's why they keep on arguing that it's not a problem and we're not a very large polluter. It's because under the accounting rules, we don't have to count that pollution in our inventory. It's counted in the inventory of the countries in which it's burnt. So right. part of the problem to us is the UNFCCC rules because that's how it's um, presented. Uh, currently, I'm also fighting against natural gas, which uh, there's about to be a huge uh, gas, what I call a gas bomb, uh, off the northwest shelf where Woodside is attempting to uh, get approval for extending the gas uh, facilities and uh, gas fields for another 70, uh, for another 50 years out till 2070. And yeah. that, would that would be 7.7 .7 megatons of um, methane every year. Uh, out to 2070 and I put in a submission yesterday um, to the Western Australian government saying that that was a crime against humanity, which I'm sure they'll say that's a ridiculous thing to say, but it is a fact. It is a crime against humanity what they are doing. Yeah. So um, the Greens are full on opposing Adani, full on on the climate emergency uh, here in Hobart this week. We've got three Greens on the Hobart City Council out of nine members and the Hobart City Council voted on Monday night to declare a climate emergency, which was a great victory for the three Greens on the council. Uh, you've seen in New Zealand that government has um, uh, voted for uh, net carbon zero by 2050 and there is a Green there who is the Minister, James Shaw. Uh, Several countries are getting on to it. So it's building. But our main problem in Australia, and I'm sure you share it in the region, is the, the ownership of the media is very concentrated and the Murdoch media have a huge amount of power. So Rupert Murdoch uh, and his Sky News um, uh, TV outlets in the UK, in the US and Australia are particularly powerful at completely ignoring the anti-Adani um, uh, movement, except to promote it as anti-jobs, anti-development, you know, anti-progress, uh, etc. They certainly don't report it in any kind of a positive way. So um, um, we're up against it, but rest assured, uh, we're doing everything we can through social media and through the parliaments 
and we'll continue to oppose Adani and there's going to be a uh, big um, non-violent protest movement against Adani. This is not done and dusted yet and you'll find it'll be Greens who'll be at the front line of that uh, non-violent protest movement. And as I said before, I'm encouraging the grannies of Australia to get themselves up there and get arrested because <laughs> they, the, there will be criminal penalties and I don't want to have to submit young people to lose those life's opportunities because of it. Right, right. Thank you. That was excellent. So comprehensive your answer was because I was wondering about social media as well, trying to reach people maybe more on Instagram where the kids are looking and also, um, you know, the older people, probably the ABCs are best shot. But yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very much, Claudine. And that was really impressive, Christine. And we have that uh, question from Suhili first. But I think Anita wanted to say something before. Okay. Yeah, I, this was regarding the Adani uh, movement in uh, Australia. Uh, Bob Brown uh, from Australia is in, uh, in touch with the president of India Green Party, and they are going to uh, and they're going to have a joint campaign against Adani. Uh, we are just waiting for the registration part, and then we'll come up with a campaign. Thank you. Um, so, hi, uh, this is Suhi from Korea. Um, uh, it was a very inspiring and at the same time very practical uh, uh, speech that I heard and in light of that. Um, as a person who, who's, who's very uh, assured that the agenda is put forward by the Green Party anywhere and the Green Party Korea would get us into the uh, Korean National Assembly one day. Um, something has always bothered me because a lot of my friends who used to be very progressive has now beginning to turn into very conservative people and they're beginning to turn away from green agendas. Um, and uh, one of their reason was because they are disheartened by the fact that we do not have a legislative uh, representation in Korea yet. So, uh, um, so my question, therefore, is: What do you think, or from your own experiences, what can we do as a party and as a member of the Green Party uh, until we get ourselves represented in the Parliament? Um, I. Uh, I encounter this sort of sentiment and question from most of my friends around me who consider me as a naive uh, idealist <laughs> who just does not let go uh, of, of the green agendas. So, yeah, if there's anything. Thank you for being that person who doesn't let go <laughs> of the green agendas. We need you uh, and everyone else to keep on holding on to that. Look. Um, all over the world, Green parties have stayed in opposition on, you know, uh, not having any elected members for a long time. They've also had ups and downs. The German Greens have, you know, been very powerful, lost lots of people. The French Greens, the same. You know, unfortunately, it's up and down. But the difficulty is getting that first person elected. And I can understand how frustrating it is in Korea not to have got, been able to get to the point of getting someone elected. But you will get someone elected at some point. And um, I mentioned to the Korean Greens when I was talking to them on Saturday, um, the saying in Australia, you can't be what you can't see. And that's why it is so important to get someone elected because then it does give people a sense of reality that they can be that person, that the Greens can be elected. But having said that, it's sometimes easier said than done because the electoral systems and the culture in many of these countries just make it very, very difficult. So I don't have, there's no quick fix or easy answer to this, but certainly don't give up the idealism. And you'll find that a lot of people start changing um, 
changing their views once they start um, accumulating assets. It's, uh, you know, it, that's why it's this issue of young people vote for us between the ages of 18 and 24. Then they're, by that time they've left university, they've gone into careers and suddenly they're thinking about what they'll need to accumulate wealth, what they'll need to buy a house and all that sort of thing. And so their focus changes onto their own life trajectory rather than what's what's the state of the world and you know what what they could contribute so hang in there stick with it um, but what i wanted to that's something that i think um, the global greens need to better understand is the barriers that are actually preventing people being elected is it the cost of registration is it the electoral system are there any chink are there any chinks in that um, are there any local government positions? I mean, I know that the South, that the Koreans did well in the Seoul elections. That was quite inspiring. And across the rest of the region, there must be the points of entry to represent elected office, whether it's at the city level, the regional level, or the national level, state level. Um, and that's really, we have to work together to try and make that happen. And I certainly hope that the Global Greens coming to Korea for the Global Greens conference will give people a sense of, yes, if you do have an electoral system that enables the election of Greens, you get them elected and wow, aren't they impressive when they get there. And I hope that's the message we're gonna be able to give the Korean Greens when we get there. So hang in there for, <laughs> and we'll be there with you. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Suhi. Uh, next, we have the question from Naja Juros. In fact, it, <laughs> hello, and thank you for your frankness, Christine, how to start the election. And uh, it was really inspiring to know that you have done it, uh, though your financials were on a very low limit. And this is a very hard challenge for every uh, candidate to do. Thank you for sharing. My question, or rather it's an intervention and it's not about election. It's about changing the view from a green, uh, uh, green <coughs> cause to <coughs> an economy. Instead of opposing the current hazardous corruption, regarding the economy of coal, economy of gas, economy of uh, environmental depletions. Uh, I was thinking, why don't women start another trend of thinking of a green economy of a lower consumption, of reducing consumption? And that is a great part that women can do. Since the beginning of this millennium, the third millennium, women were pressured to take action in producing and income generation, uh, income generation, and they say that women can change the economy, the global economy. Why don't we as green parties, can we change into a greener economy, which is a lower uh, income generating uh, subject? It doesn't have to do anything about the election, sorry to uh, get out of the subject, but I was uh, to take a part in the in leading a new thought, not opposing the current corruption thoughts. Okay, so there are a couple of things there. First of all, uh, the new green economy is something that is very strongly part of the green policy platform around the world. It was actually the Green New Deal came from the Greens. Um, I introduced a motion on the Green New Deal following the work out of the UK that the Greens there were doing and in Europe. And now, of course, the Green New Deal is a big thing in the United States with the Democrats. So the Green New Deal is very much about looking at a green economy which is based on uh, ecological sustainability, uh, closed loops, a circular economy, uh, renewable energy, and uh, less consumerism. 
But certainly, I think there are a number of uh, actions the Greens could take, and and waste is a very large part of it. You can only you can see the plastics campaign around the world. There are prominent campaigners from the Greens and with women's movements working to try and get people to abandon single-use plastics for a start, and that's been very evident in Australia in the supermarkets where people have now become accustomed to taking cloth bags and getting rid of plastic bags in that, that cycle. Um, people are beginning to recognise consumerism is a problem with fast fashion, and women can certainly take a role in just refusing to engage in fast fashion. I was horrified about the extent uh, of waste in the fashion industry. And that's, that's something where women could, if they chose to take a really substantial disruptive action. But I think um, the, the integrity measures, the anti-corruption measures that we're talking about are part of the Green New Deal. It's basically saying that the silence and corruption and money that changes hands in the old economy is not what we want to take into the new economy. And one of the things the Greens are working on around the world, which inspires me, is um, universal basic income. Now, if we could get that, it would just make so much difference because it would free up so many people to be able to do volunteer work and community work and so on because everybody, regardless of their background, would have a universal basic income. So that's something the Australian Greens are looking at. It's certainly something the Greens in other countries are looking at. And we're very serious about this, trying to uh, get to a point where everybody gets a basic amount of money. And then after that, if they want to earn more or choose to earn more, they can. But it will enable people to work less, uh, as in the paid workforce, and to put more back into the community as they used to do with um, looking after the young and the old and the sick and engaging in schools and sport and so on and, and the arts, I think that would be transformative and that's something that women are very committed to doing. So universal basic income, the Green New Deal, 100% renewable energy, getting off fossil fuels, opening up uh, decision-making to a broader group of people through proportional representation are all parts of that, getting to that new um, new way of operating in a greener world. Yes, thank you very much for saying that will be amazing. Um, next question we have got from Michelle. Sorry, hi, Christine, thank you very much. Um, most of the women on this call from Asia and the Middle East are, are already leaders in their own parties. They're the uh, women's representatives on the regional women's network or um, they're involved in party executive or in some way like that. So I guess my question is um, a, a, lo a lot of people on this call have um, started this step on the pathway to leadership uh, within their own parties. Um, and so what would you advise um, or suggest um, to continue that pathway, their career pathway? Um, many are just starting out now in leadership within their parties. And it's really fantastic that this group is a support network for women that are doing that. So what would you suggest for women that are just beginning on that pathway? Well, Michelle, that's, that's why I chose to speak about, you know, some of the things to consider right now. And the first thing is know yourself, know your skills, uh, identify your support network, identify what you need and ask, to, ask the party to provide, help to provide you with what you need right now. Um, and be very clear about where your opponents are, where your uh, likely allies are. Um, it's really a, a strategic pathway, if you like, because until you sit down and work all that out, it's not clear how you might move next. So um, that would be my advice to people starting out to sit down and think that through. What's next? How do I grow the party? What do I need? Uh, to enable me to do that 
and where will I get it from, who will I ask, and um, how will we fundraise to provide it? Because you can't do anything without money. And the other thing is, if the barriers are cultural, um, then the best people to identify how you might shift that culture are people within that culture. So we need to hear from women in the region, what are those cultural barriers and what ideas do they have about um, how, we, how the Global Greens might be able to use influence to help them um, get beyond that? Because certainly uh, people are, are prepared to do it, but uh, aren't really sure how to intervene or how best to intervene or to influence the situation. So it's really people in those local cultural contexts who need to tell us what they think they might need once they've identified where the barriers are or what they think is the thing that most realistically could change in the short to medium term. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I think uh, we will have the second last question now uh, as we have got limited time frame now. Uh, Mary Therese? Hello, Mary Therese, you can please go, go with the question. Oh. oh, I guess she has left the meeting. Oh, she is here. Hello, Rashana. Yes, so Mary Therese, you raise I, your hand. Okay, please. Yes, I would like to highlight that uh, the activist woman in Lebanon since 2017, we are working to break free from plastic. And already we start to implement to break free from plastic around all Lebanon. And now we are working to make a law, implement a law to avoid plastic bags. We are working with all universities in Lebanon, like a environmental activist, like a woman environmental activist, to avoid all kinds of, pla of plastic, like a bags, like a cups, like a uh, bottles, like a straw, uh, around all universities in Lebanon. And uh, I think it's 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 uh, it's a. a, a a big, uh, big campaign uh, started by a woman, especially a woman, a green woman in Lebanon. That's what I, I, I want to highlight about it. Well, that's fantastic. And it'd be really good if you could write a few paragraphs about that woman and the campaign and the involvement of the Greens in Lebanon on that campaign and send it to the Global Greens so it can go up on the Global Greens website. It's really important that these success stories and these women who are doing things around the Greens network get that global um, profile because otherwise we're not going to be able to know about them or refer to them in speeches and that sort of thing. So. It's fantastic that it's happening. Uh, it's happening in several countries, but it's great it's happening there in Lebanon. But if you would write that up, and it doesn't need to be screeds, it can just be, you know, a hundred words or a couple of hundred words and send it to the Global Greens, that'd be terrific. I'd love to see that up on our Global Greens website. I will do that and I send you a paragraph, but if you go to my Facebook, uh you can see a lot, a lot from 2017, many campaigns in the beach, many campaigns in, uh, in, in the floor, many campaigns with many, uh, with, uh, with the Ministry of Environment, with the Ministry of Industry, concerned uh, about how to break free from plastic, how to avoid plastic, how to avoid uh, all kind of, uh, of straw and uh, bottles around Lebanon. Great. 
Yes, thank you, Mary Therese. Uh, if we will also get a copy of uh, whatever you will be writing, then it will be great. We will also try to share it on our APGF Facebook page. Um, and the last question, I think I will take, I will be the one uh, asking the light, last question. So what will, how will we be able to access to your book, Christine? Um, well, that's, uh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think it's it's probably available through Amazon. Um, I will. I what I'll do is uh, ask Amy Tyler to put a reference to where you can get it um, on the Global Greens website. That's probably the best way. But I'll let you know. Yes, thank you very Certainly much. In Australia, but you know that's not much help to people. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a soft copy on Amazon too? That's what I'm, I'm saying. I'm th I'm hoping that's it's there, but I'll just check and put a note up yes. so you can see okay <clears throat> yes we will be waiting for it yes um i guess we are at the end of the session uh it has already uh passed more than one and a half hour for the webinar yes thank you very much christine for your time it was really wonderful webinar uh it was such amazing and it inspired me a lot to move forward with the greens in nepal and globally as well Yes, thank you very much. Well, thank you, and I really look forward to meeting you all at certain events around the place and on these webinars, and um, and if not before, certainly in Korea, which I, I'm very excited about the next Global Greens conference there. So thank you, everyone. Lovely to meet you all, and good luck with greening wherever you are. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christine. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Thank you.